now. Okay. Um, well, thank you and good morning, everyone. And and uh, we know that there will be more people uh, signing on. Uh, this is, is pretty typical. Um, we've got about uh, I, I think 20 or more people signed up for this session. We are recording it. We will make it available on the Dr. Cog web website. Um, I have gotten notes from a number of people that, that uh, this timing in May kind of sucks. So uh, note to self, too close to graduations and everything else. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm Dr. Flo Rotano. I'm the Director of Partnership Development and Innovation with the Denver Regional Council of Government. Uh, we are pleased to be uh, have, have made arrangements for these series of four workshops on affordable housing. It's Dr. Cog's first kind of foray and dive into um, in, in, into the topic area, and so we have leaned very heavily on our, our partners and our friends that we know are subject matter experts on the topic. And that's who we are bringing to you today. Today's focus for the workshop is really going to be on creative out of the box strategies. We've talked about how to finance affordable housing. We've talked about the zoning aspects of affordable housing. We've talked about affordable housing from the developer's perspective, what municipalities and counties can do to make their lives easier or more difficult. And, and, and today we get to, to, to enjoy a little bit of, of that creative aspect of it. And, and, and really focus on, on some of the solutions. So uh, I'm very pleased today to turn this over to Jenny Rogers with Enterprise who has agreed to facilitate today's panel. Uh, Elena Wilkins is on a well-earned beach vacation and not joining us from, from the beach in Mexico. Um, so our thanks and gratitude to her. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize and thank a lot of the, the Brain Trust partners um, who have really helped Dr. Cog put this together. And, and that would be Alice and George with the Division of Housing at, at, at DOLA. It's, it's also um, Jamie Gomez at, at Chaffa and, and, and Elena and, and also Jenny Rogers. So thanks to all of you for um, lending Dr. Cog your time and expertise to help us put this together. So without further uh, ado, I'd like to introduce Jenny and, and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Flo. And uh, hopefully I can do as good a job uh, facilitating today as Elena has done in the past. Um, definitely agree that she deserves a beach vacation. Um, so I'm Jenny Rogers. I am the vice president and Denver market leader for Enterprise Community Partners in Colorado. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that works across the country, kind of has the capacity to have an end-to-end -end approach to addressing America's affordable housing crisis. Um, and just as a little background, Enterprise comes at the affordable housing crisis through capital investments and creating and preserving affordable homes, advocating for sound policy, and operating on a national scale. Also, while really uh, collaborating locally in communities throughout the country. So this is a great opportunity for me to get to um, meet with you all today and, and be part of this exciting panel. Um, innovation's a, a real value for us. And so getting to moderate the panel today and hear from such an esteemed group of experts who I think can help us all think about creating affordable housing opportunities using a multitude of tools um, is really the only way that we're gonna get to create enough units at an affordable price to safely and securely house residents throughout the Metro Denver region. So today you're going to hear from experts who focus on innovation in construction technology, land use and land trusts, housing and mobile home park preservation, adaptive reuse, and land use policy. Um, we have great examples of efforts here in Colorado and um, throughout the country, really. On our first panel today, I'm very excited to um, introduce uh, three panelists, Brad Henderson, I'm sorry, yeah, three panelists, Brad Henderson, who's Director of Business Development and Partnership for Colorado at IndieDwell, um, that's really thinking about uh, innovative technology in the uh, manufactured housing sector. Um, Brad comes at us with, um, I was reading his extensive bio, lots of background in um, construction technology, development, 
um, and I think is going to bring some really interesting uh, perspective to you today. Andy Cradlick, Program Director at Thistle Rock at C Thistle Communities, um, and then Aaron Maripol, President and CEO of the Urban Land Conservancy. And Aaron, of course, is a leader in our nonprofit real estate development community in Colorado and has been the president of Urban Land Conservancy since 2007. We're gonna let each panelist have 10 to 15 minutes to provide information. And once they've all spoken, we are going to open it up to Q&A. If you have questions while our panelists are speaking, please feel free to drop them into the chat and Flo and I will be monitoring so that we can answer them all when our panelists are done. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brad. Thank you, Jenny. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, let me go ahead and share screen here real fast. All right, so, so number one, I wanna thank everybody for having us today. Um, Andy Dwell, uh, before we get in this presentation, I'll kind of roll fast through it. Um, we're a, a 501c3 nonprofit um, mission-based volumetric modular builder. <laughs> well, uh, a mouthful, but um, uh, Indy Dwell was formed in, uh, in Boise, Idaho, Indy Dwell Holdings with the goal to truly make an impact on, on, and change lives. Um, there's been several studies done that if, if a family lives in a good home uh, at, a, at a, either a rent or a mortgage payment they can afford, uh, they are healthier, their kids are healthier, their kids are better educated, it's actually generational. And so the thought was, how can we take the gifts the good Lord's given us and, and make an impact in, deeply into people's lives? And so Andy Dwell chose to do that by building homes. Um, we're very famous for building homes out of shipping containers. Um, I will tell you, everybody in Pueblo and the Pueblo factory is very thankful that the very last shipping container homes are going through the factory right now. Uh, variety of reasons, um, but the biggest one that, that we're shifting to uh, light gauge steel framing and structural steel, depending on how we're going, is the fact that it's getting harder and harder to get your hands on one trip or shipping containers. Uh, we're nonprofit and so everything comes down to cost. Uh, if you were to come to the factory and see us bring these brand new shipping containers in because most states won't allow you to, to recycle shipping containers so they're brand new. Uh, we spend two to three days tearing them apart and then going back in with structural steel, oftentimes spending more on the the, the, the structural improvements to that container than the container cost us. Uh, also, you're, we're very limited. You're down to an eight foot wide uh, footprint in the modules by using shipping containers in either 20 or 40 feet long. Uh, it, it's so much nicer to be able to get a breath of fresh air and stretch out and get into wider modules, uh, longer modules, shorter modules, whatever to make it fit the project. So, so just real fast with that. Um, and like I said, we are volumetric modular. So we, we do everything we possibly can inside our factory. Again, the goal being that the best labor and the most economical labor is inside that factory. Um, a lot of the, uh, the financing on affordable housing requires Davis-Bacon wages to be paid on site. We do not have to pay those in the factory. Now, with that, we start out and we pay our people extremely well, um, which, which I think, again, Flo, you're from Pueblo. Um, our starting pay for completely non-skilled, walking off the street, just want to get in this business, start learning is $17 an hour, full benefits package, health insurance, uh, paid time off. I mean, it's, it's incredible what we give our people. So, um, so anyway, but, but saying all that, we want to get as much done as we can in the factory as possible. We have our own mill workshop in the factory. We have a stage for fire sprinklers. So um, anyway, our goal, the, the best way to leverage modules, if you get a single dwelling unit inside one module, we put the siding on, we put the roof on, we truck it to the site, we crane set it on there, uh, appliances already installed. Basically, it's move in ready once we've either welded or bolted it to the foundation, made the utility connection. So so real fast, uh, Indy Dwell Corporate Overview, again, uh, um, we work we're, as a nonprofit, and I'll explain that here in a minute, because Indy Dwell Holdings is a B Corp, but when we set up uh, Indy Dwell Colorado, it was as a 501c3 nonprofit. But you can see right there, we work, be, because of our philosophy and how we're wired, we work very well with foundations and nonprofits and housing authorities. In fact, I'd say our number one client is housing authorities. Um, Instead of, and, and, and Jenny, kind of going back to my bio, it's, it's why I, I, even though this is my first stint in residential and, and, I, and I sat on the other side of the table buying a commercial modular in the past, but, um, but, but working with, with housing authorities because the, 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 the vertical construction is only one piece of, of the overall development, okay? Um, and and we, work, we work very, very hard to provide a premium product at an affordable price, but we love being part of that team of, of how do you solve the entire problem? Because we know that that 
that that cost of that home or or that apartment or that condo or whatever it in the product in product ends up being is really a compilation of what it costs to uh, buy the property, what it costs to properly entitle that property, uh, permit fees, tap fees, uh, dealing with soils conditions here in Colorado is, is always an, an issue, uh, foundation cost. I mean, everything adds up. And then by the way, then you add that dwelling on top of it. And so we're working very hard to engage with housing authorities and municipalities and go, how can we solve this problem overall and be a part of that? Um, so one of the ways is, is I think a lot of, but it might come up today is uh, we're, we're working with cities on, on possible mobile home parks. How could we go in and, and the, the city take that mobile home park and we kind of phase in more permanent housing. Uh, we're, we're doing some developments right now. We've got some single family. We put some, some of our duplex and fourplex product in there all the way up to apartment buildings. So, so anyway, that's, that's a little bit on, on our philosophy and our DNA. You can see the partners there that we've partnered with uh, currently, um, uh, you know, with, with, again, the focus to change society by providing wonderful homes. Um, we, uh, we're, we really are, you know, like our mission is revolutionize the residential construction industry by producing dwellings that not only better their occupants' health and well-being, but simultaneously improve the healthy environment and empower communities. Um, in doing so, we're solving three major social issues, affordable housing, economic development outside of the major metro districts, um, and then workforce development. And, and that's, that's what I want to say there is it, it's, it's so neat. And I want to offer uh, the, the, uh, the opportunity if anybody's coming down to Pueblo in, in our area, I'd love to take you on a tour and, and show you the difference of our factory. Um, all of our, all of our employees, it, it's so neat to see a factory that people are working on building homes that they actually can afford. Uh, and that's, that's rare in some factories. So uh, we, we truly want to make a difference in Pueblo and Colorado, the entire Rocky Mountain region. And and, and again, if you came to the Pueblo right now, you'd actually see we're shipping some product all the way to California. Um, we, we're trying to create a new prosperity across the board. Uh, so, so for our employees, the environment, our customers, uh, our suppliers, our vendors, uh, as well as the community around us, we want to lift everything up and everyone up around us. Um, you can kind of see here that, that uh, when you come take a tour, we have a model unit set up in the factory. And, and, and I and everyone, the majority of the people leave saying, hey, I really thought that I was going to see, you know, a lower end type of a product. We, we produce something extremely premium. We have the ability to come off of those standards, but back to our nonprofit side, we, we really want to kind of push that envelope a little bit and provide uh, extremely good homes for people. And that's where you kind of see our focus on indoor air quality, no VOCs. We have an energy recovery ventilation system in every unit that shocks people sometimes. That's, that's something that goes into very high end homes. Uh, the, our standard countertop is quartz countertop. Um, the, uh, you can see there's solid core doors. I've had people come down and just, just be fascinated with the doors in our model unit. And they'll say, you can't get those doors in half a million dollar homes these days in Colorado. And yet we're providing them. We put those doors even in, in our homeless product, our, our rapid rehousing product. Uh, if, if we can do it in the, in the, in the factory, you can see there the, the, the building you have there, that apartment building, it made the most sense for us to create, you know, complete the inside of the units, uh, create the corridors in the factory, but then ship them uh, wrapped in OSB and building paper. And then that siding and that exterior treatment actually goes on on site. But whenever we can, if we can create the, the exterior of that, that unit in the factory, it's going to be the most economical for somebody. So one of the best is fiber cement siding. Uh, you know, we can do masonite, any, anything that won't fall off going down the road. Um, I will tell you though, if, if we're in an environment or municipality or a region where architectural guidelines require stone or stucco or brick or something that'll fall off, just like that building you see on the screen right now, we'll just ship it with building paper and our crews will install that on site or the general contractor can. Commercial grade flooring, in fact, everything is pretty much a very high end commercial grade uh, de uh, delta uh, plumbing, uh, all the fi plumbing fixtures, Pella windows, uh, our, our, our level of Pella windows just blows people's mind. Frigidaire appliances, all, all energy star rated, and then again, steel exoskeleton. In fact, when people ask me, what's the difference between us and other modular builders? One is that we are 501c3 nonprofit, our philosophy. Number two is that we are all steel. And I'll get to that here in a minute. Um, again, moving out of shipping containers, but still into to all steel, very rigid. Um, very uh, nearly waste-free construction, carbon neutral construction this year. Um, all of our, uh, we, we are net zero energy ready if our name's on it. And so you can see they're all, ener all LED disc lights, her uh, disc lights, sorry, hers rating of 60 or lower, uh, continuous thermal break everywhere, very tight construction. In fact, I love it when we go in the factory and 
if we can do a tour while the, the factory's up and going because the model's on the factory floor. People walk in, they're almost holding their ears walking through the factory. You close the door on that model unit and the sound just dies. It's incredible. In fact, um, hopefully it's still up, but if you go to uh, Indy Dwell's uh, YouTube channel, you should be able to pull up a virtual tour that I gave to Chaffa um, uh, late last year, and you can actually see that. It comes across even, even in, the, in the videoing. Uh, rigid insulation exceed all the all the energy codes, uh, Energy Star windows, mini split HVAC. Uh, we will. I, I want to say on the on the HVAC system, we'll do what's best on the apartment building. Some we're doing PTEC, we're doing VTEC, um, we're doing rooftop unit mounted units. It, it just all makes sense. But our standard is going to try to push for that very efficient mini split HVAC and heating system. Again, we've moved out of the shipping can containers. We're into steel framing, uh, which which I really enjoy because not a lot of people, we were always constantly having to educate building officials, uh, structural engineers on, on shipping containers and how they work. We've moved into something that the industry has really been doing for probably a century of, uh, of, of just building offsite. We build the IBC and the IRC. So it's exactly the same building codes that you, you know, any office you guys are sitting in your home sitting right now, we build to those codes. Um, and we're, we're not, uh, we are not many uh, uh, tiny homes. We're not mobile homes. Uh, we, we are real structural structures that uh, just happen to be built off-site uh, in very climate-controlled environments. So just some of our some of our framing details. Uh, we do multifamily, small multifamily, single family. I'd say that 80% of our work out of the Colorado factory is, is multifamily from, from duplex and fourplexes up to uh, four to six story apartment buildings sitting on top of podium. Um, as we get into, we start scheduling into 2022, I think that even goes up. We're probably in the 80% range, 80 to 85 of apartment buildings, large multifamily, but uh, it, it's very big to uh, our general manager and myself of, of the one of the main reasons we joined Indy Dwell is we want to make that impact across the spectrum. So again, we'll, we'll always be out there taking care of people in single family detached, uh, as well as a smaller multifamily, along with the large apartment buildings. Um, we, well, as I kind of cross in a, when you take a tour, I'll walk you through how we're a three to four line factory. It, it's got to see it to understand it. Um, but right now we only have one line operating and that gives us the ability to, to really create multiple uh, projects at the same time going through the factory uh, with the goal being that we can, we can finish three to four finished modular units per day. Um, per shift out of that factory. And so our goal is to get up to a million square feet if possible, a year of finished, of finished modular out of, out of the Pueblo factory alone. Um, so again, workforce housing, you know, really I think we, we, we serve best probably that 30 to 50% AMI all the way up to 120% on the workforce housing. Um, we'll, we'll work with somebody if they're doing for market, but, uh, but we really, we really want them to show us that, that all the savings we generate that gets passed along to that end user, um, because that's not our mission. Our mission is to make an impact on affordable housing. So our goal is workforce and down is, is where our, uh, where our best fit is. So here's just some projects and partners we've worked on currently working on with, um, and, and yeah, then just down to our employees. Um, income development again. Our, ours that's the uh, the Boise, Idaho is sixteen dollars per hour. We start at seventeen in uh, in Pueblo. Um, I, I think I'll leave it at that. That way, I got time for. Oh, I guess the other thing, real quick, is this slide. And this this isn't just Indy Dwell. This is modular as a whole. Um, part of the reason that uh, my background in, in commercial industrial, why I, I purchased some some modular for some for some commercial projects. But you you can if if the whole team will come around and work together as one group to leverage modular to its fullest potential, you should be able to get about 20% savings off of, of normal stick built construction. And then you can see the time savings. Um, you know, most of the time you see, you know, dirt work happening and foundations on a project. And then when you first see the first two by four standing up or the steel going up or concrete starting to go vertical, that's when you think the construction starts. Well, in modular, if we've all done our job right, our modular units are showing up as they're stripping the forms off that foundation. Once it's cured enough, we're setting those things on there. So the construction timeline, once the foundations are done, goes from sometimes months or maybe even years to, uh, to days, weeks, or months when it comes to modular. And so that's the other part that you've got to figure into this is how quickly you move out of your construction loan financing into permanent and you get people living in these homes so much quicker. Um, Again, uh, this the B Corp certified is, is Indy Dwell uh, Holdings, um, Goodwell Partnership, uh, Goodwell certified. Um, uh, I will I will stop there. Hopefully, I didn't go too long, Jenny.
No, you're doing great. Thank you. Lots of great information in a short amount of time. And I just want to let people know that um, we have some questions, um, but we're going to hold all the questions for this panel until all the presentations are um, are done, but please continue to put them in the Q&A because we've got some good ones so far. And thank you, Brad. That was really interesting. Um, we're gonna move to Andy um, from Thistle Rock USA. So Andy, if you wanna share your screen. Thanks so much, Jenny. And yeah, Brad, that was super in interesting. I think this will be a great transition to go from modular to really focusing on our, our existing infrastructure of manufactured housing in the state of Colorado. Um, so quick introduction. Once again, my name is Andy Cadlick. I'm Thistle Rock's program director based here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, Thistle and Rock USA have been working together in the state for around three years to uh, essentially bring forward this resident owned community model to the state of Colorado. For a quick overview on, on Thistle and Rock USA, um, you know, Thistle is an affordable housing nonprofit. We've been in Boulder County for, you know, 30 some years, incorporated in 1988. Thistle's mission is to provide affordable housing for low and moderate income, income individuals and families in Boulder County and the surrounding areas, more specifically now statewide with our Rock USA partnership. And just a brief overview of some of the different lines of business that this will include, you know, operating affordable rentals, third party property management, home ownership under some CLT models. Um, as well as new development, but more specifically I'm here today to talk about um, our partnership with Rock USA. And Rock USA um, is another uh, you know, nonprofit that kind of had its beginnings in the 80s. Uh, the first Rock, which I'll use that term a lot, which stands for resident owned community, was created in 1984 in New Hampshire, um, basically financed by the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund, one of the first CDFIs in the country. Um, that program developed in New Hampshire in a lot of different ways, but they officially incorporated nationwide as the Rock USA Network in 2008. Rock USA's mission to make quality resident ownership viable nationwide and to expand economic opportunities for homeowners in manufactured or mobile home communities. So Rock USA has a, a couple different, uh, you know, sets of, of, of kind of business line that they have split up. Uh, the network, which covers certification and training. Rock USA Capital, which is a CDFI that exclusively lends to communities that are purchasing their parks. Rock Association, which is an association of all the existing resident-owned communities across the country. And then what we call our CTAPs, or Certified Technical Assistance Providers, that is Thistle. So Thistle is an exclusive affiliate of the Rock USA program for the state of Colorado. We are Rock USA's partner to um, engage in resident ownership under this cooperative structure in the state of Colorado. Um, so the, the brief overview of what exactly a ROC is, it is a non-for-profit business or cooperative corporation that has um, a membership exclusively of residents in a manufactured housing park. Each household has the ability to essentially have one membership stake in that cooperative, wherein that cooperative or business essentially owns the land and manages the business that is the manufactured housing park. So uh, typically the structure of a manufactured housing park is that the resident owns their home and the landlord owns the land. The residents lease the land from the landlord. In this process, it's, it's similar but different. You know, We're creating a structure where the cooperative, which exists of residents, own the land you know, in a community fashion. Neighbors continue to own their own homes individually and an equal share of the land beneath that entire neighborhood. And so what we're really doing with this model is, um, you know, creating a lot of different advantages. You know, we're giving the residents who live in the park the control over their monthly lot rent, control over community repairs and improvements. These residents will be working with us to create an annual budget, a capital improvement plan to ensure long-term stability in their community. And they are essentially putting together a budget that they are paying for directly out of their pockets, ensuring that they're gonna be, you know, effective um, they're going to be taking care of issues ahead of, ahead of time and really creating a community that's stable and, and successful. Um, and really preservation of this affordability. You know, manufactured housing parks in Colorado are, there are over 900 in the state, and it's a huge source of affordable housing for, for Coloradans. Uh, part of this model is really agreeing to a perpetual preservation of that park as it exists. And so we are creating a community that can never be resold can never be redeveloped. These residents will feel more stable and secure living in their homes in these parks because they know that a new owner won't come in and try to change the use of the land 
or raise the rent in an unreasonable fashion and kick them off the property. With that stability, it really gives homeowners more opportunity to build assets and, and essentially invest in their homes. You know, residents often feel more secure in, in doing repairs and upgrades to their home because they are much more confident that their home won't be forced to be relocated by a different ownership or, or any sort of uh, change of use, as well as the stability of a home in a resident owned community brings a lot more attractiveness to other buyers when they are selling their homes. If you compare a, a home for sale in a co-op versus a home for sale in maybe a corporate owned community, um, there's a lot more guarantees that that resident owned community um, will be around for a long time and that those individuals will have the opportunity to be involved in the decision making and governance of their community. And really most importantly there as well is, is the opportunity to create leaders in your communities, give the residents an opportunity for really power and self-determination that often they never had in a situation living in a manufactured housing park. They are essentially renters in their homes. And so this is an opportunity where you turn those renters into owners, business owners, as well as leaders, and we're able to give them resources, training, and education to help them understand how to create a successful community, how to be a leader, and how to really engage your neighborhood and uh, become a community that you want to live in. So what Thistle Rock does in this situation is, as I mentioned earlier, we essentially engage in the community as a CTAP or technical assistance provider. We provide the resources, training, and education that you know, typically these residents may not have or have experience doing. And we provide support from day one, where we either find out their park is for sale or engage them with an opportunity, up until the entire life of a loan of 10 years. So from day one, we're helping them organize as a cooperative. We're helping them you know, register and make sure they're in compliance with all those governance um, aspects. We're helping them put together um, the financing and negotiate a purchase and sale agreement with the owner. We're guiding them through the due diligence process of hiring engineers, attorneys, appraisers to take those steps in any sort of commercial real estate transaction that anybody, any buyer would need to know how to do. Um, take them through closing and help them set up all of the appropriate contracts, management, maintenance, taxes, long-term capital improvement plan so that they are essentially a successful organization moving forward. And then we are committed to that community for the life of that loan. Typically, um, the financing comes in a 10-year loan amortized over 30 years. Um, we sign a contract to be with them and have support, offer support to them for that initial 10 years with always the opportunity to continue to renew that contract with the residents um, if they so need that. So. And I think one of the more important aspects here too is that you know our oper our relationship with the community gives them access to financing from that CDFI Rock Capital, who could provide financing up to 110% LTV. Um, it's a very unique um, you know financing opportunity. Residents in a in a newly created cooperative typically won't have a lot of business experience or opportunity to achieve financing from any other local lender. So this is a very unique structure where we can bring the funds to the table to have them be a competitive buyer, purchase the park, and essentially create the community they want to live in. As I mentioned, the Rock USA model started in 2008, and across the country, um, there's been a lot of success. To date, over 270 of these communities have been purchased and are now owned by the residents. That's over 18,000 home sites preserved across the country in 18 different states. Rock Capital has been involved in a fair amount of those transactions and has provided hundreds of millions of dollars in financing. And I think one of the most important aspects here is that every single community created since 1984 is still owned by the residents and in existence. And so they have a success rate of 100% in preserving these parks and having the residents have that control and be their owners. Just a brief overview of some of our different affiliate partners across the country. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of experience and activity in the Northeast as well as the Northwest. In Colorado, if you look closely, you can kind of tell there are three different dots on that map. And so to date, we have helped, uh, Thistle Rock has helped create three different resident owned communities that span five different mobile home parks. Two of those are down at Fremont County in Canyon City. Another community is in Longmont in Boulder County. And we are also under contract to close two more parks in June. And so we'll have two more resident owned communities preserving another 180 units in Durango as well as in Boulder County. And I think one of the big aspects that has created a lot of opportunity for us is the new legislation that's come to place lately called uh, the Opportunity to Purchase, House Bill 2012-01 that was passed in essentially June and signed into law in July of 2020. 
um, is an opportunity that gives residents a huge right to be aware of when their park is for sale, organize and potentially get to that point where they can secure financing and purchase their park. This new law requires owners of any manufactured housing park in the state of Colorado to notice every single resident in their community of an intent to sell, a pending sale, or any sort of change of use of the property that they're intending to do. If it's a pending sale or intent to sell, that owner must give residents 90 days to essentially organize, um, analyze the opportunity, potentially submit a purchase and sale offer, and obtain, finance, and obtain a binding commitment of financing. So within 90 days, uh, we have to help these residents, if they're interested, get to a binding commitment of financing on their community. It's a pretty huge challenge, but we're really excited that the two parks were closing in June. We're both noticed under this restrictive 90 day timeline and we've been successful in securing financing with a rock capital that's CDFI, as well as a variety of different local partners, including the Health Foundation, um, application through the Division of Housing, as well as some local CDFIs that have offered support for these deals. So one important aspect of this law that is that it is an opportunity, not a right, and owners must negotiate in good faith. So being a new law, there's some language that needs to be clarified and we're working through better understanding that with residents as well as owners of mobile home parks. But as I mentioned, there are over 900 mobile home parks in the state of Colorado. And so that is over 200,000 of our residents living in those communities. There are plenty of opportunities for, for preservation and we feel like we are an organization that has a lot of tools and experience to help these residents secure their housing I um, mean, really um, have the opportunity to have some power and privilege in creating a, a positive future for their community. So, you know, and a few of the, the most important aspects of these co-ops are that they are very democratic. They're based on membership of, of residents in the community. They're operating on a not-for-profit basis with exclusive benefit for the members of those communities. And I will stop right there. Thank you, Andy. Um, I really appreciate that presentation and especially that update on um, the recent legislation, which was, um, I know, a big push and can really help support residents across Colorado. Um, and again, for anybody who's just joined, we're going to hold questions till the end of our three presenters on this panel. But next up, we have Erin Maripol from the Urban Land Conservancy, who's going to talk about the value of land trust. Thanks, Jenny. Um, thanks also, Andy and Brad. Uh, Andy, uh, I cut my teeth on mobile home park in, in Boulder with Mapleton, so it's uh, uh, many years ago, but uh, that, that was uh, one of the, I think one of my most cherished uh, memories in working on that was a, a, an amazing community, so thanks a lot. And Brad, just so you know, we did a modular at that mobile home park on a chassis, on a trailer chassis, so um, kind of the combination of those two things is uh, really, uh, well, it is clearly a need and I appreciate what both of you guys are bringing to the table. Um, just quickly about ULC, we're a, a nonprofit real estate company. We were seeded capital back in the early, two, early 2000s um, by an oil and gas company. They um, put the dollars to get, get us set up. Um, uh, it's kind of its roots was uh, Gary Williams Energy. It's the same folks behind the Piton Foundation and Gary Community Investment, which I know Brad, I think GCI is a, certainly a partner with you all uh, in, with your plan. Um, and again, kind of our, our vision is really to, to serve underserved populations, primarily uh, neighborhoods and communities um, of risk of gentrification and displacement. Um, are you guys seeing this okay? Is it moving? All right, great. Um, so to date, uh, 44 uh, investments, 130 million in direct investment. That's leveraged about 1 billion in redevelopment, the range of permanent affordable housing, commercial uses, mixed use development. Um, Again, the numbers we serve over 30,000 folks, um, primarily in BIPOC communities in the Metro Denver area. Um, that's BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, we've created over 2,000 full and part-time jobs with our real estate work. Um, we've served over more than 3,000 children. That's because of the number of schools that we've been a part of and helped create. And then on the housing side, uh, we've supported uh, over 1,100 permanently affordable homes. Uh, primarily uh, rental housing, but we also, as we talk about below, we've incubated Elevation Community Land Trust, which is focused on affordable home ownership. And I know Elevation's working with Brad uh, on a couple of homes uh, here in Metro Denver. Um, the other big part of our work is really around commercial office space. Um, and that's um, 
also been really challenging. We serve over 60 nonprofits uh, and it's been challenging because of COVID. Um, and so how the future looks up for commercial office space is one we're, we're still trying to figure out and, and learn about. Um, I think folks know the challenges around affordable housing in Metro Denver, but we have at least a shortfall of about 150,000 affordable homes. Uh, about 50% of our residents in Metro Denver are cost burden, um, meaning they're paying more than 30% uh, of their income on housing. Uh, the other piece uh, I think is interesting even during this pandemic is that industrial space and the cost of industrial space has gone up. And why is that relevant? Because quite frankly, we, we have bought industrial space for nonprofits that are doing light industrial, that do um, tech work and other things. And so industrial space is a, is a primo piece of property and folks, it's been very competitive. Um, I will just share the, the property we get the most calls on is not our residential apartments or any of those things or land. It's a warehouse that we own in Sun Valley and there are investors across the country who wanna buy it. And Sun Valley is a neighborhood that's going through major redevelopment being led by the Denver Housing Authority. Just bring it up is that industrial space, we probably, we would never do this, but we could probably sell it for four times what we bought it for because of this huge need for and demand on industrial space. Um, Traditional community land trusts, nonprofit, community-based, um, really focused on community stewardship of land. Can be used, as I mentioned, in a lot of ways. At ULC, we have typically been using it for commercial and multifamily housing. Um, most CLTs are focused around home ownership. Um, we acquire land and we partner with nonprofits and for-profits uh, developers. We lease that land under a 99-year ground lease that can be automatically renewed a second 99 years. Um, the land lease really ensures that um, whatever happens in the future with the housing above it, the school above it, that if those go away, there's a change in use. Because we own the land, we're ensuring that it's going to have a long-term community, community benefit. So what today is rental housing, maybe tomorrow is for sale, or what today is a, a school, maybe something as an office space. And I'll share a little bit more as we go through this. Um, kind of the advantages and divis disadvantages of our work as you compare us say with a land bank agency, a government agency, we have to move quickly um, on deals. We don't have kind of patient necessarily the patient capital that certainly government agencies have. But the other thing is when we buy land and we're holding land, um, we really need to come up with what are the plans for the future? And so um, we act as a master developer. Um, we also um, work with as far as in this case, what you're seeing the images of, what's that big hole? There's a bunch of brownfield remediation that we had to do, and we had to create this massive detention facility. I swear, this is a, an Olympic-sized swimming pool at a site uh, at Colfax and Irving, so really central Denver, where we have the, down below, you can see the new library, and then there's housing there as well. But we had to do this to actually do all the water detention and some brownfield remediation. Um, anyway. The other advantage, advantages I would say for us is, or, or disadvantages, that we carry debt. I mean, if we were a government agency, we wouldn't have to carry debt on it. Um, the other disadvantage for us is we have to pay property taxes. Look, I'm, I'm all for paying property taxes, but we're paying over a million for a year in property taxes. That really makes our work challenging. Um, it also again speaks to the timing. So, you know, if you hold property for longer period of times, obviously you have a lot more holding expenses. And so, even as a nonprofit, we pay property taxes. And I, as I said, I'm, I'm good with paying some of that, but to have to pay this much annually is really hurts our ability to do our mission. Um, so how do we go about acquiring land? We've had government agencies, nonprofits, others actually donate property to us. Um, the two properties you see there, Holly Park is in Westminster, six acre site that the city had to take back from a foreclosed developer. We bought that um, about two years ago for a dollar, and that will be redeveloped into permanent for sale housing in partnership with the local home builders, Thrive Home Builders. The campus on the right um, was a former Excelsior, non Excelsior was a nonprofit uh, that had education programming there and other services. This is the largest property we own. It's a 31 acre campus in Southeast Aurora. And again, the nonprofit was closing its doors and instead of just like selling it on the open market, they turned to us and said, ULC, because of your stewardship work, we really think it's best that we, we work with you. And so thanks to them, um, I mean, this was a huge, uh, huge opportunity. Um, we have AmeriCorps Southwest that works out of this campus and we also have family 
uh, Tree, um, which is a nonprofit that works in Arapahoe County and Jefferson County. And so not only did we take the, this property, but we've now put over 3 million in, in improvements and we've got the kind of core campus, if you can see with my cursor. So this is the kind of the core campus, the oldest part of the campus, which was built in the 1960s. We had to replace all of the um, heating and cooling systems, roofs, et cetera. So we invested over 3 million and we've taken this core campus basically to net zero electric. So we have almost 500 kilowatts of solar. Uh, you don't see it here, but we now have a solar array here on this open area. And then we also have geothermal that's heating and helping cool uh, the core campus. Um, so that's a huge, like getting this to net, net electric is a huge saving, not just for us, but also for AmeriCorps Southwest that's operating out of there. Um, we also, about our work, leveraging community development. So again, we identify, we look at what are the needs of in a community, you know, not just housing, but also kind of other kind of nonprofit uses. Um, we collaborate, identify other sources, obviously getting grants to help support the work is, is helpful, but the loans are the biggest part. So we take on a lot of debt to do our work. We have patient capital. We've worked with Jenny in the past with the TOD fund that was really critical um, locally to buy properties around transit sites to do permanent affordable housing. Um, just wanted to kind of talk about racial equity for a second as this is core to the work for us. Um, and it just kind of the stat that I think is really stunning. Uh, the average black family uh, nationally has uh, their wealth is just one penny for every dollar held by the average white family. I share that because in most of the neighborhoods we're working on, as I meant, you know, both black, brown, et cetera, that is one of the big challenges. And so what is a way that we can help in the wealth building? And what is a way also that we can ensure that these communities are gonna stay really hopefully diverse is th through the use of our ground lease. I should also note that the first community land trust in this country was started in the civil rights movement in Albany, Georgia back in 1969. And it was led by African-American folks in that community uh, in Southwest uh, Georgia. Uh, new Communities is the first community land trust in the country. And a lot of us in the land trust world look to them as really a model. Um, just for folks, if you're interested, there's an amazing documentary about their start. It's called Arc of Justice. And so you can definitely, I can, I'll post that later, but that is a great documentary. It tells that story. Finally, kind of just kind of some of the ways we've used the CLT, multifamily Jody Apartments, the Boys and Girls Club, which is at an old Ali Shopping Center, is in a 99-year ground lease with us. Center for African American Health, this is a great story. Um, they're right next to the Boys and Girls Club. Um, they ultimately are buying a building that had we had to buy back, but because we had the ground lease in place, um, we could ensure that that building would stay a community benefit. And so Center for African American Health is going to be the owner of that building. Uh, Family Star Montessori, uh, Walnut Flats, which is permanent affordable housing. These are, again, I've mentioned schools, housing, all of these things that you're seeing are ways that we use uh, the community land trust. And then the last one I would point out is Latella. This is a development that Elevation is doing, but we bought the land and we held it you know, as a land bank. Um, they are finishing up and I think will be open sometime this summer, we're 92 permanently affordable condos. This is the first permanently affordable condo development that I know of uh, in Denver. And so this is a really exciting new opportunity. Um, this is a follow-up on to the Holly and I'll just take really kind of a minute here. So this is about an African-American community, Northeast uh, Park Hill. Um, this community had seen, certainly uh, had had this incredible rise in the 1960s and 70s. Um, integrated and then became, quite frankly, predominantly an African-American community. Um, in 2009, uh, we bought the former Holly Shopping Center. It had been, unfortunately, it was the shopping center had been burned down in 2008 um, based on some gang conflicts between the Bloods and the Crips. Um, and so we were asked if we would be willing to come in and support this work. We absolutely were excited, but we also knew that we couldn't just go buy this property by ourselves. We couldn't just come up with a plan by ourselves. And so we worked very closely with the Denver Foundation and their Strengthening Neighborhoods uh, effort, and we worked with the community. And so what drove, drove getting Boys and, <clears throat> excuse me, Boys and Girls Club and Roots Elementary School there was really the community, it was the stakeholders. It wasn't ULC saying we need a Boys and Girls Club here, we need Roots Elementary here. And so that is kind of a core piece. Again, unfortunately with Roots, um, 
because they had to close their doors in 2019, we were able to buy back the building at a discount because we own the land underneath roots. And so that's another really key piece is that, again, owning that ground is what allowed us to buy that building back. And now, as I mentioned, we're selling it to the Center for African American Health, another amazing nonprofit that's been working in the community for more than 20 years. Um, I'll just really quickly. So this is an apartment uh, building. We actually, in partnership with Enterprise, we bought uh, this site back in 2011 um, at $25 a square foot. Um, today, that land is over $200 a square foot. Um, and Brad, before I got, forget, we should definitely talk. Um, we have a small parcel that I think would be really interesting at this location to do something with you all. So we'll, we'll definitely need to talk about that. Um, in partnership with Enterprise, we use the TOD fund, as I mentioned, to buy it. And then um, we work through a process with a local developer, Medici, on their third round of getting tax credits. It, it took three rounds to ultimately get um, tax credits. And again, this is low income housing tax credits is the largest producer of affordable housing uh, in the country. Certainly in Colorado, it's the largest producer. Um, Chaffa, the Colorado Housing Finance Authority, is the entity that issues those tax credits. Incredibly, incredibly competitive. Um, and so that's why uh, our partner didn't get their credits until the third time they applied. Um, again, you can see the stats about it, but what's really key here, and I would really, I'm really proud of, is that we were able to get the bulk of folks in the neighborhood, folks who lived in Cole, Five Points, uh, Globeville, Larry Swansea, that live around this location. And this is right at the station that takes you from downtown Denver all the way to the airport. So it's a literally you're half a block from the station at this location. But we were able to get folks from the neighborhood who could actually get into these apartments as opposed to just anyone. And I think that that was a really, that's a really important story that we think we have to be doing more of. Um, that's basically it. Thank you all for uh, taking the time. Again, I think we think land is is a critical tool to uh, support long-term, not just affordable housing, but long-term community benefits. And um, we look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. That was a great overview of the value of land trust and all, it's amazing to look back in time and see all the projects and, and uses that you've been able to pull in at ULC, so really impressive. We're gonna open up to questions and answers now uh, for our panelists. So I know we have a couple in the Q&A, right, Flo? Yeah we, yeah, we do. And, and uh, the first one is, um, actually for Brad, can indie dwell modular units be assembled for multifamily developments? Yeah, um, uh, maybe, maybe my, my screen show there wouldn't come through, but yeah, probably 80% 80, 80 or more of our developments are multi-story, multi-family apartment buildings. Uh, so designed to go five or six stories tall. If my design team was here, they'd say, hey, you know, depending on the project, we, we design for the project, design for those snow and wind loads and building codes. Um, so we could go even higher than that. But the majority of them are apartment buildings. Uh, and then fourplex, duplex, triplex, on down a single family detached. And then a follow-up question to that, can they also be used for mixed-use commercial and multifamily type development? Yes, yes, Flo. Um, so we've got we've got multiple projects where the first floor either on podium or or non-podium uh, is is commercial retail, you know, type of a, of a development. And then we go on top of that with the, with the residential units. Okay. And and I also know that Paul Hazeman had his hand up. So Paul, if if um, You'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. You, there Brad, you, you talked about having a a twenty percent advantage against stick build, but it seemed like that was a qualified statement. What is the general benefit of? of your modular housing compared to stick build. And I, just before you finish uh, answer, you know, FHA, uh, Foothills Housing Authority is building a stick build project in our community in Golden, Colorado. Uh, so we understand stick build. So what, what is the advantage of, of modular? 
So, so one, Paul is 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 again that we're steel framed, especially today's day with what's happened with lumber. So it's a huge difference. So that's where I kind of qualified that twenty percent. Depends on when we do this. Steel has gone up as well, uh, but really your your biggest part of modular. So forget Indy Dwell and the fact we're nonprofit and how we do things differently. Just look at a modular project across the board, and that's if all the stakeholders team up and and they really leverage everything you can do in modular. Um, there's there's several parts of it, Paul. One is our buying power. Uh, the fact and, and the fact we're buying materials out, you know, six to nine months out in front of us. And so we can we can stay away from a lot of these fluctuations in commodities that others deal with uh, the, the very, very close to, to zero waste almost. Um, you know, you think it's it's really so I've got 35 plus years in the construction business and, and probably the closest thing I've seen to. Uh, Indy Dwells modular factories when I was doing high rise with Mortensen where, you know, maybe in a 40 story building, we had 20 to 30 floors of exactly the same. We got really good at producing that floor, you know, over and over again. So the same thing happens in a factory. If all of a sudden you're going to hit us hit a factory with just a one off or one or two of something, and then they're going to have to, you know, retool and do something else. You've lost the, the benefit of it. But if all of a sudden we're doing the same thing over and over again, we've got, we're designing three apartment buildings right now in Denver. And, and I think there's like over 400 modules. We only have three different floor plans. They are leveraging us to, to the hilt to make that happen. So it's, it's reduced waste. It's, it's definitely time because now all of a sudden, like I said, while, while, while that site work's going on, foundations are going on we're actually building those units complete in the factory so we show up and boom boom this thing is done and you're handing people the keys to move in um so really it, it, it's it's volume buying cost savings it's lack of waste uh, I, i'm also going to get into labor for a minute again my, my i've never done anything else so my dad was a real estate developer commercial builder um so i'll just you know my, my whole life when i was a teenager i was i grew up you know you'd You'd show up to the job site 6:45 ish or so. You get on the job by seven. Maybe you're working by 7:20, 7:30. Uh, you have your breaks, and then you know 3:30 comes around. Well, everybody shuts down 3:05, 3:10, so that you're definitely in your truck pulling out by by 3, you know, 31 um, at the factory. And then you start all over the next day. So so really look at how many productive hours you got. Maybe six hours. Uh, wherever the, our teams left their tools yesterday. Uh, they show up the next morning, they're right where they were. Um, climate controlled environment, so you don't have to worry about mold, rain, snow, weather delays. Um, I mean, I could keep going, Paul, but that's really how you make up that average of a 20% savings. But I will say with modular, you have to commit to it early. It's not something where, you know, I get a lot of people call me up, especially now with, with where, where lumber's at, and say, hey, Brad, got this fully entitled project. Here's my plans. Can you run me a number on it? And say, yeah, I sure can. But, but you know, unless it was designed for modular, Lego blocks of how things stack, and, and line up, you know, you want to do as much as you can in the factory, I'll come back and say, okay, you've got to be flexible to redesign. And so all the money you spend on, on getting that thing to the billing department, probably have to toss most of that so we can start over and convert over to modular. So it is a process. I, I, you know, I just want to say that you can't take any project and say, hey, I'm going to say 20%, you know, by going to modular and it'll look exactly the way it was stick built. You, you've, it, 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 it is a major process and all stakeholders have to agree to it. Thank you. Thank you. That's interesting, and that's a good lesson on when to start thinking about um, using modular and con connecting with a builder like you. Do we have other questions? Anybody want to raise their hand? I don't think, Flo, we have any other raised hands. Whoops, I just raised my own hand. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I clicked on the wrong thing. Uh, Paul, you have another question? As long as no one else is asking. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, you also mentioned, Brad, and I'm sorry to ignore Aaron and Andy, but the, the uh, duration issue about, uh, because that project's being built by, by Foothills Housing, it's been out there building, 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 it's been six months uh, they've been building that thing. Uh, if we do the planning you're talking about, what is your timeline uh, for building? Well, Paul, it all depends on the project. So I'll just I'll just kind of zero in on the modules. Uh, and, and let me start off with, we still have to go, unless you go with something we already have in our library that's been approved by the state of Colorado, you know, all the structural and, and mechanical, electrical and plumbing engineering is done. If we go with something special for you, we've got, we've still got to create those documents. And so there's really, you know, I'm going to start with, there's 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 two sides to the, to the entitlement process when you go modular. You've got the local municipality, the local building department. You still going to need a local architect to get you through all, all of that. Uh, civil engineers, landscape planning, you know, everything on that piece of it. 
and then we want to work side by side with that 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 project architect if you will and come up with the, the the designs for the building all right we'll handle the floor plans we'll handle the structural mechanical electrical and plumbing of the building we'll also do the the engineering of the foundation if if you'd like us to because a lot of people want one engineer of record on the entire entire building um but we want to work alongside them and then once we get to the point where they're they're through schematic development through design development and somewhere in construction document permit documents where all of us feel comfortable hey that local municipality, municipality is going to let you build what you have drawn then we got to take off on our side which is all the engineering of the modules themselves and our submittals to the state of colorado um so just saying and 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 right now even though that the state of colorado is kind of bogged down we we definitely if we all start off at the same point in the beginning you don't wait to to, to get us involved as your teammate um our entitlement process is definitely shorter than that local entitlement process in Colorado, but all that still has to be done. So I just want to say that because where I'm leading up to is once we have those entitlements, we, we have all of our approvals and we procure our materials, we can create a finished module in our factory in 15 to 20 days, depending on how many steps we have. So like fire sprinklers is a step that maybe you would have in some projects you wouldn't have in others. So 15 to 17 days. So, and, 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 and it's, I guess it is, I'm going to say it actually is linear because what we, once we charge that line, it takes 15 days to produce the first one, but then every day thereafter, we're creating a, another finished module. All right. And like I said, we have two, three, possibly four lines that we can do, depending on how big the modules are in the factory. So, so now all of a sudden, maybe we, we don't like to dedicate more than two lines to one project, just risk on us. Um, so we might be producing two module units per day. So depending on the size of the project, once we get through that charging of our line, every day we're producing a module and then we can store those down, you know, in Pueblo at the factory, you know, for a certain time period before we need to deliver to the site. But our goal is going to be produce a floor of that building, ship it to the site and they start putting it up. The erection crew, depending again on, on what, what we're doing, the project, things set somewhere from seven to, to 11 modules per day. And, and then, they, then they get the stitching process and everything else on site. So, so that's why I said you, you take a typical construction project that takes months or, or even years. I mean, I've, some of my projects took, took years. Um, they were so large. Now all of a sudden you've converted that back as long as, as, long as we've all done our job together. And that's why Indy Dwell wants to be part of that, that, that entire pro, uh, construction team to make that happen. But now all of a sudden you've converted those years or months into days, weeks, or maybe, maybe a month or two, depending on the size of the project. Thank you, Brad. You bet. Okay, one minute. We have uh, time for one more question. Um, thanks to all three of you, uh, really great information. If we don't have any more questions, we can start to transition into our next panel. I don't see any more hands. Well, thank you all so much. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and I, I sometimes think I know a lot, and I learned something from each of you today, and I'm sure the others on this call did too. So i um, really excited to get to listen, and thank you for all the time and all the uh, things you're doing to house people safely in Colorado. We really appreciate it. And anything we can do to help Andy, Aaron, I mean, this we, we this is why we exist. We're not for profit. Like my, my last 35 years have been what you guys are doing is exactly why we exist. So please reach out to me. I put my email in there. Anything, anything we can do for you, let me know. And I'm sure um, the same for our other panelists. Um, if anyone on the call wants to reach out and learn more about how to preserve a mobile home park or how to think about some um, land trust opportunities that may be in your community, um, that Aaron and Andy would also be glad to speak to anybody on this call. I'll speak for you guys, but I'm sure. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Jim. That's great. Yeah, thank you all. My thanks on behalf of Dr. Cog for, for the, the, the three of you. Um, Aaron and Brad, I'm delighted that you two are, are, are going to follow up on this. And, and uh, Andy, yep. it's wonderful to have met you through this entire process. This is one of the things that Dr. Cog likes to do if we like to connect dots. So... Um, for any of the panelists, any of the participants, if you have further questions on this, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. You all have my email, and, and um, I'll make sure that, that you get connected with, with uh, who it is you need to get connected to. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it, everybody. Take care. For those of you who have been uh, 
here are here as attendees. We're going to transition to our next uh, panel of exciting experts. So I think I see that everybody's here. Um, so on our second panel, um, I'm really happy to introduce, let me pull up our bios here. Um, we have uh, five panelists on our second panel. We have Alex Radke, senior planner with the city of Austin. Um, she is with the city of Austin's housing and planning department and administers the department's density bonus and developer incentive programs. Um, and has some really exciting best practice, I think, to share with us on, on planning and how communities can make a difference in providing affordable housing with the planning. We have Andy Hill, Community Development Office Director at the Colorado Department of Local Affairs. Um, Andy has worked for the Division of Local Government and Department of Local Affairs for over 25 years um, and provides expertise on local land use planning and offers education, training, resources, funding, and advising to communities. So that's exciting. Thank you, Andy. We have Beth Truby, Preservation Officer at the Colorado Housing Finance Authority. Um, Beth is the Preservation Program Manager and has 35 years of experience in affordable housing and community development. Um, we have Eric Kronberg, founder of Kronberg Urbanist Architects. Um, I know, Eric, I'm excited to hear from you because you're a zoning whisperer. So I don't know any zoning whisperers, but um, I'm hoping that you'll share some of your tips and tricks with us today. And we have Sue Powers, Susan Powers, president of Urban Ventures LLC. And if you all don't know Susan, she is a powerhouse in the Denver real estate and Colorado real estate um, industry. Um, she has built multiple mixed income and mixed use projects in and around downtown Denver for the past 20 years. Um, and we're going to get to hear about a really exciting project called ARIA that's a, a, a reuse of a, of a site up in uh, Northwest Denver. So um, excited to hear from all of you. And again, like our first panel, each panelist has 10 minutes to provide some information. Once they've all spoken, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. If you have questions while our panelists are speaking, feel free, feel free to drop them in the Q&A, and, um, and then afterwards you can raise your hand. So we're going to start with Alex. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Bear with me while I share my screen and hopefully get this right. Um, let's see. Here. Can y'all see my presentation? Yes, but Alex, it's not in show. In, it's not in show mode. We're, we're seeing yes. the PowerPoint. Let's see. All right. How does that look? Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Again, my name is Alex Radke, and I'm a project coordinator with the City of Austin's Housing and Planning Department. Excited to be here with y'all today to talk about our newest density bonus program called Affordability Unlocked. I'm going to try and keep this to 10 minutes. <laughs> um, going over a quick overview of what the program is, uh, some of the ways in which we think we've gotten pretty creative with this involved. Um, a quick look at sort of what we've seen so far in our initial project pipeline and then some lessons learned. All right, so uh, affordability unlocked. Um, like I mentioned before, it's our newest density bonus program in Texas. Uh, inclusionary zoning is illegal, not allowed, and so this is a voluntary program. Um, we have some other density bonus programs that have been around uh, in the city for a while, but most of them are pretty geographically limited either to, for example, our downtown or to a transit oriented district. This is a citywide program, though, um, and it was passed by Council in May of 2019 um, and was not fully up and running until probably about September of that year. So um, at least from the staff perspective, it's still it's less than two years old. Um, the goal behind creating the program uh, was to really help us in reaching one of our affordable housing blueprint um, metrics, which is to try and create or preserve 60,000 affordable housing units by 2027. Uh, and that 60,000 number was the gap that was identified when we did um, a housing survey. 
um, some years back, looking at kind of where we're heading. Um, in addition, there were some other kind of points that our council really wanted us to work on with this program, namely trying to maximize affordable housing subsidy dollars, making it easier and less costly to build affordable housing, which is what we're all trying to do, right? Um, and then also trying to increase the areas around the city where we could put affordable housing, particularly in high opportunity areas that might um, otherwise be difficult uh, to get affordable housing projects in. So what we came up with um, was a program that does not require any funding because it is, again, a density bonus program. So in exchange for participation, uh, the applicants um, receive modifications to development re regulations um, as they move through the development process. Um, there's no funding other than, you know, I'm the staff person obviously getting to administer it, but no additional funding beyond that. Um, it also tied into the affordable housing bond that voters passed in 2018, so the year before um, the program came into being. Uh, it was the biggest affordable housing bond that we've ever passed as a city, 250 million, uh, which is great, got lots of money to spend, but if y'all haven't heard, Austin's become a very, very hot real estate market that's very, very expensive. Um, and so our affordable housing developers were letting us know that even with all this money, it was going to be difficult uh, given the current market conditions to, to build and try and achieve some of those affordable housing goals that we'd set. And so keeping that in mind, we wanted to make sure this was a program that would expand access um, and to where we could build housing and then also pair really well with all of our other affordability tools um, so that we could really give it all we could <laughs> um, and making sure that folks had flexibility in choosing and combining the right tools that would make a project feasible. One of the more unique things about this program is that, as I mentioned before, it is a citywide program that essentially any site with a commercial or residential base zone on it is eligible for participation. Uh, and as you can imagine, in particular, any commercially based zoned site um, that piece really opens up a lot of new possibilities that previously uh, were not available uh, when considering housing projects. Um, and that ties to the fact on my last point here on the slide that by going through affordability unlocked, folks are able to avoid the rezoning process, um, which in Austin tends to be pretty lengthy and pretty expensive. And so if they have a commercially zoned lot that they want to go ahead and build a multifamily building on, if they get a certified, they're good to go. They can, can they can start uh, the development process immediately. No need to go through rezoning at all. I'm gonna try and dive through this part pretty quickly because it's a lot, but I just wanted to give you all an idea of kind of what what does it take to participate in this program, and then also gonna go over what do, what did the applicants get in exchange. Um, and so just to get started. Um, in general, um, if a project has three units or more, 50% of the units must be affordable. Um, and for rental, which is what I have up in front of you right now, that's gonna be um, on average uh, serving 60% median family income or below for a period of 40 years. 20% of all of the units have to serve households at 50% median family income. And then 25% of the affordable units have to either have two or more bedrooms, serve as supportive housing or serve as housing for older persons. And then we do require that there's a lease addendum um, with some additional tenant protections for all of those rental units. On the ownership side, somewhat similar in that again, at least 50% of the units must be affordable for a project that's three units or more. Um, this time targeting uh, an average income of 80% median family income for a period of 99 years. Um, and then we have that same similar 25% of units either have to have two or more bedrooms, provide support housing or house the elderly. In exchange for that, um, there are a number of development modifications uh, and waiver, well, we'll start off with the waivers um, that developers are able to access. Uh, one of the big ones that's been helpful is certainly being able to waive compatibility requirements being able to waive Florida area ratios. 
um, waive the waiver of dwelling unit occupancy limits, uh, which was something of an issue for us in the city a couple years back uh, with some stealth dorms because we are a university town. We're having um, students, you know, uh, doing their best to lower their rent, uh, 10 students in a three bedroom house, that kind of thing. And so we'd had a law that had been passed that limits the number of uh, unrelated individuals um, in certain districts of the city. This waives that lit occupancy limit. It also provides some modifications um, to the minimum lot size and lot width. Um, and then an, another really important feature is that the maximum height allowed uh, is increased by a factor of 1.25 times the base zoning maximum height. And then when we look at our single family zoned lots that typically would have a cap of only one to two units allowed on them, um, if you participate in this program, you're able to go up to six units per lot. The parking modifications uh, essentially bring down parking requirements to the ADA accessible parking. That's it. Uh, and then we also have some front and rear yard setbacks. And this is all for what we call our type one certification. Under affordability unlocked, we have type one and type two. Um, type two simply builds upon type one. So anybody who wants to do type two is going to have to get do all of the type one requirements uh, and then a little bit more. So there's four ways that folks can uh, achieve a type two certification. Um, they and essentially all of these are pretty much upping the affordability commitment in different ways, right? So by the sheer number of units, by targeting deeper uh, lower income households, um, the one maybe slight difference to that is this final one. So you can do 50% of your units, including trauma bedrooms, which is trying to target building more family friendly units. Um, you can have for rental units, 10% of your units serving households at 30% MFI or below, um, or you can have 75% of your units affordable to households on average at 60% MFI. If you're talking about rental. And then um, we've been really trying to focus on increasing um, residential development near our main transit corridors. So if you're located within a quarter mile walking distance of an imagined Austin corridor that is served by transit currently, um, then you would also qualify for type two. If you do type two, there's really only two additional modifications um, as far as thinking about the bonus side of it. but. As y'all can imagine, this is a big one. The maximum height um, factor goes from 1.25 times your base zoning max height to 1.5. Uh, so that's pretty helpful. And then if you are a single family zoned lot with a unit cap, instead of having a limit of up to six units, you can go up to eight. So here I have in front of y'all are kind of what we've been seeing happening in our first as I mentioned, roughly year and a half, two years. We've received about 68 applications as of April of this year, 34 of which have been certified. Most of those have gone for a type two certification. That's essentially that what we've certified has ended up um, adding up to a little over 3000 affordable units. 70% of which have been rental and then 29% have been ownership. We've been really excited to see that at this point, we now have about 21 units that have reached the site plan or building permit stage of development. Um, and I, I know of a couple that are getting really close to actually finally um, getting their certificate of occupancy, which is really exciting for us. And then going back to that point um, that I had made earlier where we wanted this to be a program that worked well with our other affordability tools We've had 74% of the certified project applications indicate that they did plan to participate in either City of Austin funding, which we have a rental assistance and an ownership assistance program, and or participate in the federal low income housing tax credits program. So obviously this is pairing well, folks are wanting to use this with these financing tools. And then we've also seen that 85% of the certified projects have pursued what we call smart housing, which is one of our older development incentive programs that provides fee waivers in exchange for uh, certain commitments to affordability um, and a few other things. The smart program is a little bit older, so the affordability thresholds are lower than affordability unlocked, uh, which has meant it's typically pretty easy for folks 
if they're going after affordability unlocked to also pursue smart housing. Uh, so then they're getting both those development modifications and bonuses of affordability unlocked, in addition to the uh, smart fee waivers, which again, just kind of helps that bottom line. So we're still, it's still a pretty new program. So I think we're still got, there's still more to be learned. But so far, um, one of the points I want to make that I think is really interesting is that while I think this program was initially kicked off by our affordable housing developer community, it's actually seen a lot of participation as well from market rate developers. Um, again, our market is pretty hot right now and folks are trying to do whatever they can uh, to make a project work. Um, and that's actually meant we've had a number of market rate developers reach out to us who have felt that they could make a project work with 50% of the units as affordable, which is great. Um, and certainly in part due to the market conditions. Um, some of the feedback that I've received as far as what's the pieces of the program that have been really helpful uh, to applicants include avoiding rezoning, um, that, that's huge not having compatibility requirements and being able to increase that height, which allows them to get to a density that will make the project uh, more feasible. Um, parking requirements being reduced alone has often been cited as one of the single most important reasons why a project is pursuing affordability unlocked. And then also folks have mentioned that they appreciate being able to pair this with example, oftentimes uh, with the low income housing tax credit program. And that's all I have for y'all today. That was great, thank you. Um, I know, I bet Susan's ears were perking up. She and I are on the City of Denver's Affordable um, Housing Incentive Task Force and have been working through some of this and are using Austin as an example of good practice. So thank you, Alex. Um, Andy, let's go to you. Sure, thank you. Okay. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about this bill that's in session. Normally, we wouldn't talk about a bill that's still in session because who knows what could happen to it between now and the end, but we are getting close. I hope I'm not jinxing myself. Um, so like Jenny said before, I work for the Department of Local Affairs, and we're interested in this bill in particular because it creates three new programs um, in Department of Local Affairs, two of which the Division of Local Government would run and one Division of Housing would run. So for those of you that know those offices. First, I have to say the intent of the legislation is not to use this stimulus money to just build as many housing units as possible. There are other stimulus funds being devoted to that purpose. The bill sponsors made it very clear that the purpose of this legislation is really to um, incentivize municipalities and counties to remove those land use regulatory barriers and maybe even provide some incentives like Alex was talking about to make it easier to develop affordable housing. And then it also um, envisions some resources and gives DOLA some resources to help local governments do that. So um, there are three programs created by the bill. There's an incentive program, a planning grant program, and a housing toolkit program. And just real quick, the eligibility, municipalities and counties are eligible for all of these federally recognized tribes are eligible for the Division of Housing's toolkit program. So let's start with the, the big one. The Housing Development Incentive Program is currently funded at about $9.3 million in, this, in the bill right now. We'll see where that actually lands. Um, and this, uh, this program allows the Division of Local Government in partnership with the Division of Housing, we're gonna team up on all three of these pro uh, programs to, um, to give to local government applicants that qualify, which I'll talk about in a moment, money to help them um, develop, uh, support some affordable housing development. So this money can go towards a, a pipeline project where you need to um, help, where you as a local government wanna help buy down some infrastructure costs, upgrade some infrastructure, subsidize tap fees, provide neighborhood amenities, parks, trails, playgrounds, facade, landscaping treatments, the kinds of things that you tend to see getting negotiated at the end and oftentimes killing projects. So money can be spent on all of those things, which is exciting because a lot of affordable housing money right now can't be spent on some of those, those aspects, some of those 
resources or amenities that, that can make a project really fit well into a neighborhood and sort of tap down some of that opposition that you see sometimes. The, the catch is to get this extra money, um, and, and I should say the grants right now we're imagining probably run anywhere from typically um, a few hundred thousand dollars to maybe a million dollars, depending on the project, how many units, have community benefits, um, all kinds of factors. Um, so, but to qualify, you, the local government has to adopt at least three strategies from the menu of options presented in the statute, which I will cover just very briefly. Um, so if it passes that way in any case, right now, this is just a, a summary high level of the kinds of options or strategies that the statute or the bill lays out. Um, I encourage you to go look at the bill and if you have suggestions or recommendations to the bill sponsors on how to tweak the language so that it really will work well for local governments, please do that. But this gives you an idea. I mean, it, certainly we've been hearing about um, uh, density bonuses, we're all familiar with those, but there are some interesting kind of different ones on here for you to look at. Um, also, you know, here's some more. I've just kind of tried to squeeze them into two lit, two slides in our in this list. Um, you should know. I, I want to make sure that you know that it does give the option for local governments to say, well, we have something that we think is actually really effective at incentivizing affordable housing, but it's not on this list. It gives us the ability to say, yeah, we agree. That's totally effective. We love it. We're going to count it as one of your three. That gave Dola a lot of comfort to see that in the bill. Um, and so, and we have the option to add stuff to this list if we want. And we'll go through an inclusive process and engage all the stakeholders to come up with a list that makes sense. Okay. Um, next, the, there are priorities in the funding. Um, in the stat, in the bill, it does sort of give direction to Dola on how to spread the money around. So there is a nod to geographic diversity. So it's not all going to end up in one jurisdiction. Um, it does, the, you know, the bill sponsors really want to use this as an opportunity to highlight or demonstrate best practices that communities are experiencing where they're experiencing success um, and, and pass those along to other local governments. Um, and certainly looking for maximum impact. And there's a term in the bill that you'll see here, driven by community benefits, which I think is really interesting. I think I know what that means. And I'm guessing you think you know what that means. I'm really interested in a, um, a, a process where, again, we'll engage stakeholders to see if we're all on the same page and maybe inform each other's opinions. Um, okay. Forgive me, I keep switching back and forth. All right, uh, here are some other priorities that they have laid out um, for us to consider when making our funding decisions for this housing incentive grant program. They would like to make sure that we are, you know, funding a variety of affordable housing projects, not all ownership, not all rental, making sure that there are, that there is uh, provisions considered for long-term affordability and racial equity uh, is assessed. So those are some examples. And again, that language is still in flux, may still change. So what if your local government doesn't have three of the qualifying strategies listed in the bill? Um, what, do you, what do you do? You, and if you're interested in maybe coming up with some um, or, or trying to create some in your local government, you can come to our planning, program, planning grant program. So this bill provides a planning grant program, very typical to what the Division of Local Government already offers. Many of you are familiar. Um, you can come to us for uh, funds to hire a consultant to look at a density bonus program or a use by right option or anything like that. Um, so we have some funding in there for those planning grants. We'll make that available right away and we'll stage the incentive grants to come next year so that more local governments have an opportunity to compete for the big incentive grant um, funds. We also, with some of this money, will update our model land use codes. A lot of local governments have been asking us for years to update those, and we just haven't had the funding to be able to do it. We're a granting agency. We don't really have a lot of operating dollars. So very excited to see that in there. We will be updating those and, and working with partners to make sure that we do that well. 
The, it, the, pro, the bill also creates a new program called the Housing Guided Toolkit Program. The Division of Housing will lead this and will help support. It's still yet to be developed. The bill doesn't put a lot of detail or, or restrictions, guidance on how to develop it. But we've been talking about the kind of technical assistance program where local governments apply, they move through the process as a cohort to start, you know, starting with just understanding what all the terms are and what the concepts are and what the steps and definitions and all of those things, then developing an understanding of your local jurisdiction's planning needs. Um, there's some consulting money, imagine, that we would be able to give to you to actually implement some of the strategies you want to implement. Um, and then in addition to that, what I think we've seen and heard from some local governments is really helpful. Um, you know, some assistance looking at the sites in your jurisdiction. Which ones do you think you could help uh, make um, set up for uh, developers to use? Um, talk to developers, figure out which sites really, uh, you know, you think you could build affordable housing on, and which sites you could uh, maybe add some resources, some additional infrastructure, and so on. Okay, so I, I tried to go through that very quickly again, because it can change, uh, some of the details can change, but I really uh, told Flo I was interested in hearing from you all a little bit, um, and we can do this by email or during this meeting, um, this workshop, but we're, we're really interested in um, hearing from you all. Overall, what are your concerns? What are your suggestions? Um, menu of options, what's missing? Uh, what maybe needs to be changed or tweaked? We won't have the ability to change the bill ourselves, but we can pass on uh, feedback that we hear to the bill sponsors. And then when we when we develop the program guidelines and the application and the funding limits and all those things, it would be nice to hear from communities what they think is appropriate and what's going to be really effective. Um, what is that magic dollar amount? Things like that. Um, and so let us know what we can make what we can do to make it easier for grantees to spend the funds. And tell us how you would use the funds, what kinds of projects. One concern I'll pass along that I'm really uh, worried about is these are stimulus funds, so they want us to spend them as soon as possible. Um, and we know that good projects don't work like that. They take the time that they need to, to work itself out. So, um, you know, most right now the bill envisions all funds being totally expended by June 2024. So let us know, give us some feedback on that as well. If we don't open up those big housing incentive grant funds for the infrastructure, the tap fees, the facade landscaping treatments, those things, if we don't open those up until the end of next calendar year, will you be able to spend those funds by June, 2024? I know that's a quick timeline. So a lot I just threw out at you, um, please uh, you know, pass along any thoughts and ideas that you have and happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you, Andy. Um, mm -hmm. And I did put in the chat uh, a link to the bill so that people can take a look. Um, Thank you. And I know uh, our organization weighed in on the bill. I think it's important that um, as many of you who have expertise in, in your with from your community do so as well. So we're going to move on to Beth Truby. We're going to uh, do a pivot from planning. Thank you both to housing preservation. Um, and I'm going to uh, try to help Beth with advancing her slides today. So thank you, Beth from Chapa. And thank you, Jenny, for helping me with my slides. Um, as Jenny said, I'm with Chapa. So why don't you go ahead and go to the first slide and glad to be with you here today. Um, or go ahead to the next one. So uh, I think most of you maybe are familiar with Chapa, but just a quick recap. We do invest in affordable home ownership and development and preservation of affordable rental housing. We do administer the low income housing tax credits for the state. We help small and medium sized businesses access capital. And you can see here, the magnitude of our investments really is quite substantial with over 3.6 billion invested in Colorado last year. Uh, next slide, please. Oop. One back. She's ready for me to get to the end. Uh, one before this. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to how go to backwards. Back. <laughs> Whoops. There you go. Whoops, okay, there we go. Sorry. 
Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to start off with just sharing a little background on the Colorado Housing Preservation Network in general. It was formed in 2016 by a variety of housing stakeholders in the metro area and really as a way to uh, try and respond to some of the increasing pressures that we were seeing on the existing subsidized affordable housing stock. And by subsidized, I mean if they have, were initially funded with low income housing tax credits or some other sort of favorable federal, state, or local financing, or they might receive current operating support from Section 8. So as you can all imagine and probably know, there are a lot of pressures on affordable housing. And the statistics show for every new affordable apartment created, two are lost. And some of the main reasons that, I mean, that the supply is shrinking, as you can imagine, again, in the metro area with our hot market, as um, Alex talked about in Austin, that the subsidized units, when they reach the end of their affordability period, they convert to market or maybe even for sale. Uh, and in markets that aren't as hot, they may be have some physical deterioration, neglect of properties and that kind of thing. Um, so we definitely are losing a lot of units, subsidized units. Preservation is generally considered more cost effective than new construction and it's energy and resource efficient. And it's often easier than new construction, uh, primarily because the entitled process, entitlement process is already completed. And we do have big public investments in these community assets. So it's great to be able to maintain that asset for the community, for the benefit of the community in general. And preservation really does stabilize neighborhoods and families. So this just shows, of course, mainly we wanna preserve units, but we did identify action items in these main areas. And we partner with stakeholders in the metro area, but also across the state on a variety of uh, initiatives, uh, tracking properties and owner outreach trainings and that kind of thing. Um, and we did uh, create a master database that really serves as foundation for a lot of this work. Uh, next slide, please, Jenny. So I did want to share a little bit that this is the main landing page for our preservation database. And again, that's that subsidized inventory. There's about 1400 properties, 87,000 units total in the state as a whole. And we've got a variety of information on property and owner details. And you can see the majority are located in the Denver metro area, the seven county area, that's 59% of the projects and about 70% of the units. But you can see it's also, they are widely distributed throughout the state. So these are LIHTC properties and other uh, loans that Chaffa has given, but it's also the division of housing properties. Um, we've got USDA properties in there, division of housing properties. Oh, and um, I'm sorry, the city of Denver also. So it's really a, a robust tool for it, us to use. Next slide, please. So a lot of rental housing preservation efforts across the country focus on these subsidized units and um, owners that participate in these different subsidy programs. But most of the units that are affordable to low income households are unsubsidized. So this preservation of the naturally occurring affordable housing or NOAA really is an emerging trend in affordable housing preservation. So, uh, NOAA properties do constitute most of the affordable units in the US. And I've seen estimates that even up to 75% of the 12 million affordable units in the US in the major cities are unsubsidized. So it's really the biggest share of the affordable inventory. So NOAA, what is it? What is it? It's really rental housing that's affordable without public subsidy. It's priced below market due to age or physical condition or location usually not too many amenities, if any. And a lot of times they're smaller or medium-sized properties, 50 units and below, and built maybe between the 1930s and the 1970s. And a lot of times these are good workforce housing units. They're affordable to households that are earning between 60 and 120% of AMI. And that those income levels don't aren't generally served by subsidized housing so that we really don't a lot of times have public subsidy programs that can help those um, households at those income levels so just like with the subsidized affordable housing inventory 
these NOAA properties, preserving them, it's usually cheaper and easier than building new. And they're good properties. They tend to have low vacancy rates. They have solid rental growth. They have low volatility. But if they're not projected, especially in a market like we have, they don't often stay affordable and they might be purchased and improvements put in, amenities put in, which is good. I mean, I'm not against improvements, but a lot of times they may be over-improved or these improvements may lead to rent hikes and usually then tenant displacement. Um, so that is, of course, we don't want to have that, the tenant displacement. Next slide, please. So what are we trying to do? So our Colorado Housing Preservation Network, we have started to pivot and have a, a focus on how can we preserve some of these NOAA properties. So some of the partners, Chaffa, Enterprise Community Partners, Jenny is a great partner, the State Division of Housing uh, is fantastic, of course, and Denver and some affordable housing uh, providers. We've been working on developing a NOAA database in conjunction with the Colorado Future Center. So similar to our subsidized database to help identify those properties and portfolios that we can target. And hopefully we can be a little more proactive and um, you know, really target those properties that would be more effective or in better locations, that kind of thing. So what are we trying to do? After the database to help inform the work, we, what's needed, quick capital acquisition financing is needed to help developers that are willing to maintain the affordability move quickly to compete with those market buyers that oftentimes are snapping these properties up. So uh, we need quick capital that's able to move fast. And we're trying to uh, do some pooling of capital with other funders in a preservation fund. And hopefully we could attract new capital for preservation. And we're looking at some new financing tools in addition to the quick capital, some different kind of loan products that might work better for these NOAA projects. And mixed incomes not only are allowed, it's desirable because that's one of the benefits of these NOAA projects is that they do serve a range of incomes and um, it, something for those middle income uh, households that need assistance often too, but that public subsidies can't be used for. And then those mixed incomes can make the project more financially feasible. So it's beneficial in a couple of ways. So initially we're focusing on these increasing resources for preservation but especially a quick acting, uh, low cost acquisition and rehab fund. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to share a little bit about the NOAA database as well. It's been built out for the seven county metro area and it really drills down on those rental properties that have under 50 units. That's the SMMF, the small and medium multifamily that you see there on the slide. So you can see, the Colorado Futures Center has analyzed a variety of um, characteristics for these properties, where they're located, who owns them, what's the condition. Next slide, please. And this shows some of the inventory. Now this is up to 100 unit properties, but you can see there's almost 95,000 units there. That's a, that adds up to about 95,000 units, 6,900 properties. That's versus the 1,400 properties we have in our subsidized inventory. And that's statewide is the 1,400 properties. So this 6,900 properties is just Metro Denver area. And some of the characteristics that are useful, 80% were built prior to 1974. And the top 24 owners control almost 10% of the units. So that may be helpful to us if we want to target portfolios and, and get a chunk of units all at once. Next slide, please. One of the other benefits, I, I like this slide, it shows gentrifying areas with the, um, you know, the hash marks in the, in the neighborhoods. And these are also opportunity areas. So we can map these uh, properties in gentrifying areas that we might want to target or opportunity areas that have better access to schools and jobs and services and so on. So final slide or next slide, I just wanted to wrap up with some additional Chaffa innovations, a quick plug for some of our other things that may be of interest to people. We do have some new financing tools in place for, again, these smaller scale projects, especially under 20 units, which we haven't financed too often in the past. I mean, we do on occasion, but not too often at Chaffa. 
They don't compete well for the low income housing tax credits. So these new tools can be used for preservation or new construction as well. One is a direct loan program and the other is a collateral support program where we deposit funds with the local bank that may be, work, may be funding the project. And uh, our collateral deposit will let them make a larger loan to the project. So if their usual loan to value is 70%, they might go up to 90% with this uh, loan to value with this collateral deposit. And we also are trying to do work on single family home ownership preservation. You see in the slide here, this is the first house we sold under our first look program. So we are allowing nonprofits, community-based organizations, the opportunity to purchase, purchase some of the homes that we may have foreclosed on. And obviously we don't wanna foreclose on them either, but sometimes we have to. And then we're offering them to these uh, affordable housing groups to use them for uh, purposes that benefit you know, lower income populations. So this is the first property that was sold and it was actually sold to a land trust. So it's gonna be, have permanent affordability. We also, uh, Aaron talked about CLTs this morning or earlier on the earlier panel. And we have done a couple of revolving loan funds to community land trust for them to purchase and rehab single family homes in gentrifying areas. And also, uh, Aaron, I think, mentioned Elevation Community Land Trust. We loan them funds. They're purchasing a housing authority scattered site portfolio. So they'll be preserving those for single family home ownership as well. And Andy from Thistle talked about the mobile home parks, which is also, of course, another huge source of NOAA. I think he mentioned 900 parks uh, in the state. So it's a substantial. Uh, number of uh, NOAA properties or NOAA units throughout the state, NOAA homes. And so we, we did support that uh, with funding that Longmont property that he mentioned and would love to do more under that rock model, the resident owned community model, or if there's a mission driven owner. So that's pretty much it. Last slide is just questions and happy to hear any questions um, and looking forward to further discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Great overview. Um, and I need to get out of these slides so I can see my agenda. Um, thank you, Jenny. Th yeah, thank you. So next up we have Eric, um, the zoning whisperer, who's going to um, share some more information about preservation. If, if people can stay on, we're running a little behind. Um, and I know that we have some great information from Susan and, uh, and Eric, and I don't want to run out of time. So we may go over if our panelists can do that with us. Got it. I'll, uh, I've got to go talk to Maine in a few minutes, but I will okay. try to keep the 10 minutes to help. Um, okay, thank you. I'm going to talk about housing choice and thriving communities um, through a lens of naturally occurring affordable housing. But I'm going to be talking about ways to be adding new housing, not just trying to save the old stuff um, that is rapidly being depleted and renovated into non affordable housing. So this is us, uh, multi multidisciplinary firm. We deal with development, architecture, urban design, play in these different sandboxes. We spend a lot of time on housing choice and zoning and policy. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, today. Uh, a couple key points. Um, we strongly believe that our areas with existing infrastructure are the best places to focus on quick and effective ways to promote inclusive communities, housing choice, affordability, economic sustainability, and mobility options. The places we have existing infrastructure, that's where we can do better because we're not gonna blow all our cash building new infrastructure along with the housing. And so when we talk about who we are, who are we? We're talking about America, some quick bullet points love to bring back from ARP. You know, at this point, nearly 75% of households are one or two person households. You know, we're not the, the nuclear family of three to four people anymore. 83% of households are projected to have no children in nine years. Think about that one. Think about the kind of households we're trying to build and provide for. Uh, when we look at the average size of the housing we're building, you know, in, in 1950, it was 292 square feet per person. We're over 1,000 square feet per person in 2017. It's no wonder we can't provide affordable housing. We're building way too much housing per person, the wrong kind of housing in the wrong places. Right. We like to talk about demand for walkable neighborhoods, places with existing infrastructure, jobs and transportation nearby. Um, we have such little of that in America, um, but such a high demand for it. You know, most of it's conventional single family drive only. But the, what we like to point out is often it's not so much a shortage of walkable neighborhoods, but it's a shortage of housing within those neighborhoods. 
that are walkable or potentially walkable. And so our housing stock isn't as diverse as we are, and we don't have enough of it in the places where it would do the most good. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about how zoning and housing blend together, right? You know, as a predominant land use in almost every American city, single family only zoning perpetuates economic and racial exclusion, right? There's just no two ways about it. And so we like to ask folks, you know, what percentage of the land in your town, based on land area, is zoned exclusively for single family only? You know, in almost every American city, it's over 75%. You know, 75% of your land is economically discriminatory and exclusionary. It's no wonder we can't find enough housing for our citizens in a, in, a, in a dignified fashion. You know, would you like to live somewhere with no yard maintenance? Would you like to be able to walk to work? Would you like to go to the eat and go to the store? Do you think this should be only the privilege of the wealthiest among us to have these benefits? So when we talk about policy and zoning, what I'm talking about is areas that have mobility compatibility. Um, and by that, I don't mean trains. I'm talking about bike lanes, I'm talking about sidewalks, I'm talking about street trees, I'm talking about on-street parking. Usually some of our older neighborhoods next to goods and services. It might be near your downtown, but it could easily be near that trolley stop neighborhood node. If you're a smaller town, it's next to your main street. These are the areas that have some of the stuff that could be helpful to begin with. And so when we talk about creating better places that have more affordable options, these when we see so many cities have applied low density zoning requirements over these originally built more densely permitted uh, neighborhoods and it won't allow them to change. And so we have to talk about how suburban zoning and single family only zoning is a killer to affordability, accessibility, and then also the long-term viability of our communities. And so what does this look like? We like to talk about it's low density, right? You know, this is a hundred by 150 lot. You know, that's a reasonable size lot for some cities. We look at that as a massive waste of land for housing. And it also means that you've got a lot of infrastructure per house, which means also they're spread out, there's less walkability, um, you know, less tax base to pay to keep those curbs, gutters, roads, and services up, up kept for each house. And even if you have a more rational minimum lot size, you know, this is 50 by 150, which is semi-rational in parts of the Southeast United States. Um, but if you have single family only, you still have a low variety of housing types, right? You may get a range of three to five bedroom houses, um, all about the same size, all oftentimes economically exclusive. And so there's less flexibility for people when you look at, um, you know, 80%, you know, or 83% of people are not gonna have kids, um, you know, 75%, one in two people households. Our zoning is so mismatched from our demographics, I can't even remember where to begin. And so we take some sample folks, you know, um, you know, looking for roommates, looking for a place to share, the homeowner trying to buy the first house. But in so many cities, we see a lot of seniors that don't want to leave their neighborhood because they have nowhere else to go, right? They love the downsides, but they have no housing choices. And then you have a growing family that's looking for a house to move into, but they can't because the seniors can't get out of the houses. And so when you have the single family only, particularly in older neighborhoods, you've got legacy residents that have nowhere to go and they're stuck with houses they don't really want, but they don't want to leave their community. And so you've got mismatched housing needs, right? And so all these new homeowners, desirable home, homeowners desiring to, uh, aspiring homeowners where I'm looking for, they can't get into the neighborhood because these guys, the older folks can't move out. This is a challenge, right? Like we always like to throw in color law. If you know any of this stuff is jarring and you don't like it, go read Richard Rossing's book or watch a YouTube video with him. It provides a great background to some of the things I'm talking about. And again, remember it's exclusionary. It doesn't allow us to have the places we need to serve our residents in a way that's dignified. Um, and so when we talk about what it needs to go, particularly these residents of these neighborhoods close to goods and services, we need to start unlocking housing choice. I know uh, Denver's done some good work with ADU policy over the years as well. Uh, but what happens when you start to allow more housing, you start to provide spaces for legacy residents to downsize within the neighborhood. You have ways for new people to come into the smaller units. You're breaking down the housing sizes in ways that's much more attainable to a much broader array of folks, you know, whether single parent households or seniors or otherwise. So this is the norm that we got to strive for. We like to challenge municipalities. We know you're not going to upset all your land to multifamily because you don't know how to do, we don't know how to do this humans, but we've got to start chipping away at our single family to help provide more housing. And when it's particularly with uh, accessory dwelling units that are, you know, typically legally restrained to be small, um, units, they are going to be naturally more affordable um, and, you know, in the 80 to 100% of AMI range most of the time, just by the nature of their size. And if they're close to goods and services, you're reducing transportation costs, which is a great way to increase the affordability for residents as well. And with that, I'm going to pivot to a second, if I can get my mouse to, there we go, Oops, work. The other thing um, we promote and talk about is uh, work with uh, the Incremental Development Alliance. It's a national nonprofit 
that uh, helps train aspiring developers, um, the nuts and bolts of basic and fill development. And we also train municipalities to better understand how to right size their ordinances to promote the kind of development they feel be inclusive and beneficial for their places. And one of the reasons I want to talk about this, one of the things we've really hit home on in the last four years is that uh, with InkDev, is if you uh, get your policies right, you know, for your neighborhood to allow more housing choices, that's wonderful and that's great. But if you don't have access to capital as a local resident to take advantage of the zoning changes, your uh, potential to be displaced goes up tremendously. So uh, Inc. does spend a lot of time teaching local capacity and understanding the financial tools and also working with CDFIs and local um, lending institutions to understand how we've got to match finance, development, and zoning together to get better outcomes in our places. And so you know, Inc. does got a mission of cultivating a thousand small developers in the cities they love. It's about inclusive development, you know, you know, building and maintaining in your community, in your place, you know, you know, call it tending your farm, not in the agriculture sense, but your neighborhood is your farm and you want to tend that and help the whole neighborhood improve. Um, you know, they teach and nurture small business owners, neighborhood advocates, you know, real estate professionals, how to become small developers or to advocate for small developers, coach civic and government groups and how to improve the ecosystems and connect neighborhood level doers across the country to celebrate successes and, and provide a, a cohort ecosystem to help people have uh, other folks to access for, for feedback and resources to help push their own projects forward. And so uh, we like to talk about incremental development. This is from a 40 minute pitch. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but I'm gonna get some high points to it, can answer questions if we have any time left. Um, you know, we're all here because cities are often not seeing the kind of real estate projects that they like. You know, they're not getting, you know, development that comes doesn't seem to be um, beneficial to communities. How do we bend that curve? You know, why not? You know, a couple of things we see with the typical development model, it's specialized, it's disconnected from local needs, um, it's professionalized and it's not in touch with folks. Uh, and a lot of times that's because the regulations and finance favor, you know, rigid approaches and uh, think other ways don't pass for time or money. You throw in a labor shortage, um, you throw in uh, construction costs, and then you talk about a lost art of how to design small inclusive buildings that, you know, fit in well with the community. Uh, these are the things that make it hard, right? And so what we see for this chain of events is, you know, when development doesn't benefit locals, uh, it fosters NIMBYism, which usually uh, uh, municipalities throw more fees and regulations to stop the bad development, which means there's more barriers to entry, which means only big developers can afford to pay the, the attorneys and consultants to get through these hoops, which means that the only buildings that get built are bit profitable for big developers, which means you're back at the beginning and you can rinse, wash, repeat this cycle one more time. You need to, we need to actually lower the barrier for local people to build what their neighborhoods actually need. We need to make it easier and simpler to provide the 80 to 100% of AMI housing unsubsidized in backyards and vacant lots in our neighborhoods across the country. Um, so uh, that's when we're talking about incremental development. That's the smaller scale stuff, you know, one to six units, usually one to 10 units is the, uh, the component of this. There's all kinds of reasons from a tax value per acre, attainability, uh, things that matter. Um, I really like what Austin was talking about with how they're uh, incentivizing um, you know, affordable housing it'd be really great to take part of those tier one things and allow that to, as of right, allow housing that could hit the 80 to 100% of AMI and get density bonuses to allow four units per, per line instead of six, right? Tier it down to have that kind of program right size to produce more of this naturally occurring affordable housing, the unsubsidized workforce housing that we desperately need. And so with that, I'm gonna pop off of this one and give time over to, if I can see my screen. Susan. Susan, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I wish I could see the whole 40 minute presentation. That was great. Um, I know people can um, connect with you later if they have questions. So Susan, let's move on to you and um, an overview of adaptive reuse and opportunities for providing affordable housing there. Okay, so I have to test my, my abilities here because the person who normally would do this with me is gone. Um, screen one. Oh, oh, I found the screen. Okay. There you go. I go to, I go to play. Uh, to what? From beginning. The one on the left. From beginning. Okay. Yep. Cool. Okay. Hi, hi uh, Susan Powers with Urban Ventures, and I'm just going to I'm going to speak almost as quickly as Eric did. Eric, I'm going to call Susan, you. We're going to have a Susan, really long conversation. So, Susan, a, let me interrupt because uh, oh. you need to go to the top where it says switch switch screens. One, one over, one over. 
uh, show task bar. What am I doing here? Yeah, you've you've got your cursor almost in the right place. You need to go over display settings. Um, so uh, presenter, add slide. Well, yes, the, the display settings. You want to swap presenter view and slideshow. That it? Yep. Did that work? It. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, and then I just get to do this myself with his, right? Okay. There we go. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about a 17-acre former convent that we purchased. And this, this gives you a sense of the of how long these, these developments take when you have a, a recession in the middle of it. But I started working on this 16 years ago with a handful of, of sisters of St. Francis. Um, and we did a master plan, very intentionally wanted this to be mixed income and mixed use and multi-generational. This was uh, my first, uh, it, I didn't go to Catholic school, so I had, I had no idea how I would work with a bunch of sisters, but they were tremendous. And we had, we found we were very, very much aligned with each other um, on what we wanted to do. So this was at the end of the day, as we're getting towards the end of the day, we'll have 526 residential units on it and 201 of them are affordable. The overall site plan for it, um, convent is the pink building in the middle. We created that, changed that to be a co-housing community, but you can see that there are, there's a lot of, a lot of different things going on on the site, um, which include on the right-hand side, those are affordable apartments, uh, LIHTC apartments. We have market rate townhomes that are selling for, or have sold for $450,000, $500,000 next to apartment units that are renting for $400 a month. And nobody knows the difference and nobody cares and nobody should care. So this is the, the overall mix of what's on the property. Uh, we have a Warren Village operates a 21 unit um, transitional home for homeless women and children coming right off the street, uh, waiting for them to be placed in a more permanent environment. We have 28 habitat humanity townhomes under, under, under contract, under contract, under construction right now. Um, and and I said, as I said, we have the co-housing community that has that has a 28 units in it, the former content, um, convent and eight of them are, are affordable. Um, so that's the mix of what's what's on the site. Uh, this is the convent, um, you know, a stout building to say the least. Um, and we, this is a, uh, and I'm sure that, that Eric knows what co-housing is, but it's basically condos. Everybody owns their own condo, but they come into this, into this lifestyle wanting to be part of a community and not, and, and really downsizing for this. So we have a lot of empty nesters here, a lot of people that are in their 60s. And we also have families. We created the, um, the affordable units because we knew that we couldn't get younger people into this building without, without offering um, something that was more affordable than, than the market rate units. So it is, it's really an interesting community. If you wanna know your neighbors and have dinners together every, every Sunday and garden together and all of that, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting model that comes out of, uh, actually out of Denmark, but there are hundreds of these communities small scale, and it is kind of what was discussed about the need for creating opportunities for people to still live to live in community, but they don't need to be in a single family home to do it. So that's basically it. The Habitat project is under construction now. This is their first land trust model. Um, so the whole site is in a land trust and they will basically be leasing the land to the people as they purchase their, 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 um, their homes, but they are permanently affordable um, and sold at 80% AMI or less, two to four unit, two, two to be, four bedroom units. Um, this is what I was mentioning about the transitional home for, this was the original farmhouse that was on the site. This was a, fr a fruit tree orchard years ago when the sisters purchased it. Um, Aria and the Mary Christ apartments are also LIHTC, the, the apartments that I mentioned earlier, um, and they are 30, 30 to 60% AMI units. Um, they have received uh, lots of awards for their energy efficiency, um, and one and two bedroom units, they're existing now. And these were basically our principles for, that we negotiated. Um, and it was, I think it's really important to talk about how when you wanna create a community like this, how, how do you do that? You can't do it accidentally. I mean, you have to do it from the very beginning and say, these, this is what we wanna create here and how do we do that? And then you bring in the partners and reach out to people to make it happen. Um, we also had a, close to a million dollar um, grant from the Colorado Health Foundation was given to Regis University, uh, which is across the street from us, to test a lot of the, of the theories about how to create a healthy community. Um, so we have a one acre production farm on the site and um, a greenhouse as well. 
Um, and that and that is tied in with the community, uh, not the broader community, not just not just this. Um, but that's basically how we see. That's pretty pretty fast there, huh? So that's that's the uh, the um, the aria st uh, story in in whatever set six minutes. How's that? <laughs> that was amazing. Um, thank you, Susan. I'm sure. sorry we we had pushed you to that's a few okay. minutes. Um, yeah, and I think it's really interesting that this project also includes market rate units as well. And so it's, it's a mix of all sure. types of different households. Great. Um, do we have a couple minutes if we go past uh, for questions, if anybody wants to raise their hand, put anything in the Q&A. We, we did, did have, we have question one question. Q &A. Yeah. yeah, we did have one question in Q&A about um, water rights being a limiting factor. And, and uh, that is true. Uh, in, in Colorado, but, but um, there is data and evidence that indicates that, that multifamily housing, I'm, and I'm not the high rise, not the 17 story, but, but you know, five story walk ups, eight, eight stories, smaller multifamily housing and ADUs actually decrease the water footprint of a single family lot. And, and, and that's for, because of ADUs actually it decreases the irrigable landscape and, and, and um, the, the water use of, of an additional tap um, kind of is obviated by, by, by that. So um, there, there's, Denver Water has done a lot of research into, in, into this. And, and, and so that's, that's one of the considerations um, for that. Do we have other questions? I did see a question about um, our Austin median family income, I think just as a reference point. Um, and it's about um, 98,000 for a four person household. And just to give you all a, a heads up, the median family, the median um, in, sorry, I've got a couple numbers written down. The median home price right now in Austin as of March in the city proper is 490,000. Um, which is a 25% increase from last year. Wow. Um, and so um, we set sales price maximums through affordability unlocked uh, and an eight, just to give you all an idea, an 80% at 80% MFI, a one bedroom unit would be 158 K and a two bedroom would be 180. Um, so. Wow. Uh, what a savings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Alex, I had a quick question. You know, you, it sounded like 30% of your uh, projects were not subsidized through the, you know, the typical Austin, like, opportunity bond and stuff like that. I was just curious, what are those, do you know what those projects are doing? Or the, like, how are they making it work? Um, I haven't done a, a deep dive into that. Right. But um, just from administering the program, I would say those are, you know, not shockingly, our market rate developers who happen to have a piece of property that's kind of odd that the affordability unlocked is allowing them to actually get something on there where they can make a profit and they don't want to do the additional restrictions that would come with coming going through financing. Um, and those do tend to be some smaller projects, I would say on average, less than 20 units, while you know a lot of our light tech rental projects are in the hundreds of units. But you're unlocking land that wouldn't be used otherwise. Or, yeah. or is it someone say like it's probably zoned single family, and so they could build a big expensive house, which may not be right for that location, or they could do something else and get to yeah, the six units of housing. Yeah, it's getting a lot of additional. From our perspective, it's getting a lot of additional units, um, certainly affordable units that we wouldn't otherwise have gotten, and then also hopefully some additional market rate units that probably wouldn't have existed otherwise right. as well. Great. Um, uh, any other Jenny? questions? Oh, yeah. No, I just and I, I think this is probably more of a off, off outside of this conversation here, but it would be helpful to for you all and for us to talk to Alex about who the national builders are, the developers that are building in that market. Um, so we have some context for all of the complaints that we're hearing here, and we're going to be facing. I mean, we're you know, are we? It's a it's a different situation because we. We do have the legal authority for and for inclusionary housing. So, inclusion housing, and that's and that's just going through legislature. It will be signed soon. Um, so, 
we used to have it, it's coming back, but it will come back applying to rental. And so I think that there is a lot of angst among the development community. And if you have people that are taking advantage of that that are national developers, it would be helpful for us to know who they are so that we can say, well, what about Austin? Mm-hmm. That's a yeah, very good point. Yeah, we can take a look. I will say, I think that the market rate developers that are using the program here um, are more, so far have been more of our infill builders, honestly, yeah. which makes sense, right? Those are the yeah. more tricky pieces of property to develop. Yeah. Um, but we could talk to, um, I can take a look. We have some PUDs um, on the outskirts of town that do have affordability requirements. And so those are obviously more volume builders that might um, have some good experience. Yeah, I, okay. if we had an hour to talk, I could warn you of the really um, uh, negative externalities of inclusionary zoning in Atlanta. Um, uh, if it's not properly calibrated, uh, if the carrots and sticks don't align, uh, mm -hmm. it can do a lot to completely squelch housing and further limit supply, which is the challenge we're facing. Right. No, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll take you up on that hour. Yeah. <laughs> that, so, so for well, this is great. We've made connections on our panel. That's yeah. wonderful. So, so, so for for you panelists, you all have each other's email addresses, and 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 you know, feel free to follow up on that. Um, if if you want us, if you want Dr. Cog to convene something, we can do that too. So, okay, uh, just let us know. Thank you. It's great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you to all of this amazing panel. Um, it was a great two hours. I've learned a lot. Hopefully those of you who have attended have learned many things. And I know that you can follow up with Flo if you have questions or follow-up questions for our uh, this panel or our first panel um, or want to connect with some of our panelists. So thank you all so much for spending so much time with us today. Uh, we appreciate all of your expertise. Um, and uh, I'm excited to dig in and apply some of what I learned today. So thank you. And Jenny, I want to thank you for, for your excellent moderation um, of the, the two panels today and, and uh, also for working with us and in, in, in helping to put this panel together. Um, thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. Um, we hope that, that um, Eric and Alex are, are uh, past. I'm emailing, I'm meeting her right now. I'm, I'm emailing Alex right now. The email's coming. So. <laughs> Susan so, and I can talk later. Um, so, yeah. You know, that's, that, that's just fantastic. We will be posting a copy of this, this uh, presentation on our website and, and uh, sharing the information with, with uh, all of the attendees today as well. So um, thank you so much. We are indebted to you. And, and um, with that, uh, we will dismiss the, the, uh, the meeting. Yeah, thank you all.